On this video, we talk about the film The Lost Daughter and we explore the themes and plot through the lens of psychotherapy. We are going to ask ourselves, am I a lost child? I'm Alan Robarge, an attachment-focused psychotherapist and a relationship educator, and I like to talk about how to heal attachment trauma and improve our relationships. And on this video, it's a little different from other videos I've made in the past. We're gonna talk about a film called The Lost Daughter. And the idea came to me in watching the film, the relationships, the relationship that the characters have with themselves creates a mirror for us to think about our relationship that we have with ourselves. And of course, isn't that what all great art does? Uh, it, it holds up a mirror uh, to humanity, to a mirror to ourselves. And we ask ourselves really challenging questions that we might otherwise not do because it's very easy to shy away from uh, the, the truths we're not willing to look at. And usually those truths are linked with some kind of pain or suffering. So it makes sense that we are a bit averse. Now, the way I'm sharing this is that I uh, invite you to have a piece of paper and a, and a pen, and I want to I want to ask a lot of ideas. And the premise of this uh, of this video, and I started to think about what if the characters in the film were my clients? What kind of questions or uh, process would I want to explore? And then, in fact, it became it was so easy to reference a past clients that I've had. These themes are universal and a number of clients have shared some of the similar ideas about enmeshment and boundaries and attachment trauma and intergenerational trauma and identity uh, needing to escape the burden of, uh, of responsibility and specifically the responsibility of a parent which leads me to uh, disclaimers uh, for this, to, to put it into context. A, a great disclaimer is that I'm not a mother and I'm not a parent, uh, so I do not have kids. So I think that's important to, uh, to realize. Now also, um, I'm not a mother and not a woman in that this film is based on a, uh, a, a book written by Elena Ferrante and uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal uh, wrote uh, the screenplay for this and then also directed the film and Olivia Coleman is uh, an amazing actress and we get to see her range and her the inner the tension within her inner world and inner life and trying to work out um, making uh, sense of living with trauma triggers and uh, the, the uh, straddling different identities it it, it it the film is done really well and um, uh, deserves uh, an, a respect and understanding to the uh, female cast who, who put this film together. It's really beautiful. I also like, uh, there's an aspect of a quality of water because it takes place uh, in, uh, I think it's Greece, um, and on vacation uh, in this little bubble, this para escaping to paradise. And uh, there's this, uh, at the being next to the rhythm of the water, uh, the the flow of the water also is very symbolically easily uh, easy to connect to um, a, a feminine energy, a feminine storytelling where the transitions um, um, glide into each other and are, are not very abrupt, which is uh, in a way uh, very um, mi mirrors a psychotherapeutic process. Now, in addition, the disclaimers uh, that acknowledging that I'm not a parent, also that I'm not going to present this like a literary cr critique uh, in chronological order. I will acknowledge, I will share spoilers. I will speak to the plot or ideas in as much that uh, I assume that you have seen the film and that you know it. So keep in mind, I'm not going to give a big overview of what exactly the story is. We're just going to pick right up uh, uh, after the film as, as if everyone watching this video has seen it. So this might or might not be confusing for you if you've yet to see the film. Now, another disclaimer is that it's not going to be presented in a linear way. And 
in therapy, therapy has a, a component in, in all healing work is visiting, revisiting, learning and relearning. There is a moving into uh, content and then you pull out and take a break if it's too overwhelming or we need to integrate what's happening. Oftentimes this creates a, a constriction and expansion a shutting down and, and going inward and then opening and expanding and being available for new information to come in or to integrate uh, from a previous experience in order to take that next step into growth. There's a, um, there's, there's a, a, a contracting and expanding quality and oftentimes what this means in therapy is that with clients we are talking about a theme, talking about an idea and it does not resolve itself in that moment. We might switch gears and then for 10 minutes we're talking about something um, hopefully related or something that complements it, but in a way we're gonna then come back. It is that uh, approach here in this video uh, that, that I think some of my ideas are going to loop back around and they'll tie into each other. And so it might uh, sound a bit like repetition. Now there's two aspects to repetition. There's such a thing called uh, trauma reenactment and repetition compulsion. And uh, what this means from the perspective of woundedness and um, an unintegrated wound and unintegrated trauma is that the mind, the psyche, we have this ability to repeat and play out uh, the original trauma in such a way to try to make sense of what actually happened and to give ourselves options to respond and explore in ways that we hadn't before. Now that interpretation, although um, I think is pretty widely accepted, it also, um, we need to be careful to say that some of this repetition and the trauma reenactment is not only for the greater good of integrating uh, into consciousness, meaning and choice. Uh, it's also just a byproduct of trauma that the mind starts looping and gets stuck uh, repeating the same content. We could call that intrusion. The mind is intruded upon, and sometimes this also includes the body. The body is intruded upon through these traumatic memories or sensations or feelings or thoughts, and that can have a life of its own. It's more like your brain is in in a is going a bit haywire. Uh, it's like I like the wires get tripped, the wires get crossed, and then there's this just the skipping of the record aspect. Now, what's interesting about this idea of triggers is that we see this in the film. Uh, we have the two characters I'm going to speak to the most is Leda is the main character. Nina is a younger mother who very much mirrors for Leda herself when she was younger. And just so you know, for the film, the way it's shot, we have Leda is uh, in current time, real time, as far as um, who she is today as an adult. But there's this flashback where we get to see her parenting, her children interacting with her children. And it culminated in her taking a leave of absence uh, from parenting. And it turns out that she uh, left for three years and then came back. Now, we do not hear from her children, which I think is really interesting that the way that the film is shot, I'm not certain of the book because I haven't read the book, but we don't get to hear the impact of what it means uh, to, to have the mother leave uh, for three years and to, to not have interaction, connection, uh, that the, the attachment, the quality of bonding was um, interrupted. And it's these moments where the quality of bonding is interrupted and it could be this abrupt moment of literal abandonment, of, of, of a disconnect, uh, estrangement, physically not being in the same place, but it could also happen developmentally where the parent is there, but the parent's really not there. Um, it could be a form of emotional tone, deafness, a, a way that we're going through the motions of showing up, but in a way the parent is vacant or absent or preoccupied, distracted, and 
we can see this, uh, there's, there's some very uh, specific causes that we can point towards. If a parent is engaged in an addiction, and the addiction also is a relationship, the parent is spending more time in the relationship with the addiction than the relationship with the child. Uh, someone who's a workaholic, again, in, in terms of uh, addiction lingo, is this idea of being distracted and consumed in your work that you really don't have a lot left to then engage and give the child. And yet you still have the demands placed on you to, uh, to, to shoulder the responsibility of everyday care. And what we see in the character later is the burnout, is the I relate to the character with regards to her loss of self and that if we are working, if we're overextended in providing and giving others to the point where it's at the expense of ourself or we get underwater in we're, we're a bit drowning in not not having a break we need a break to recharge and the world our everyday activity in the amount of our time that's consumed in parenting becomes a disconnect and that's not nourishing and over time we are exhausted and then we don't know if we are coming or going we do not know who we are and we're trying to show up and be in relationship with the child and we don't quite know and or we're aware that we don't really have a solid relationship with ourself and the things that we used to do before parenthood to provide some nourishment, some connection, some way to fill us up, that, that is no longer happening. And we see in the film, there's this uh, enmeshment, a, and what I'm going to say is so common and obvious that the child very much either thinks that the parent body, you know, psychologically, you know, psychologically, the parent's body is the child's body because the child came from the parents, specifically the mother. And there's this, I'm seeing the scene in the film of the child brushing the mother's hair and to the point where, you know, it, it hits her, the, the, the hairbrush hits her on the ear or it pulls her hair. And there's this moment of boundary violation that, of course, the child didn't intend to do this, but the child has no sense of where their body ends and their, mother bo their mother's body begins. And the mother sacrifices these boundaries in order to maintain connection for the child. And of course, we all know there are moments where the mother also feels a sense of connection, uh, a, a a, um, an integration of closeness that um, we wouldn't frame as enmeshment, but we just uh, fra frame it as a very powerful parent-child um, exchange. But sometimes it's not that kind of exchange. It, it, it becomes a um, loss of self. And, and the main character, Leda, is noticing all of these losses, uh, all of the interactions that create a loss of self. And she goes away on a vacation. Uh, she, she takes some time off and she enters paradise. She enters a bubble. And for me, this what, what is of interest here is this idea of dissociation and this idea of needing to escape. And many of us don't go away to you know, a, a holiday in Greece what we might do is, uh, in our own mind, shut down and check out, and we are, uh, in, in many ways, despondent. And we take a vacation, in, bra you know, in quotes here, we, we allow ourselves to not fully be present. Again, this is the origin of attachment injuries, uh, and as they go on long enough developmentally, and the degree to which they overwhelm the child's nervous system can become attachment trauma. There, there's a scene in the film that's really powerful. It's when the little girl, uh, her finger is hurt 
Um, I don't quite remember in this moment. Is it cut? Is it you know? Is it is it uh, you know uh, what happened? But the, her finger, she says, kiss it, make it better. Kiss it, make it better. And the mother purposefully chooses not to satisfy the daughter's request. And yes, we have compassion and empathy for the mother being completely at the end of her rope, that she has no, no more left to give. Uh, there's a tension between asserting will and agency to hurt the child um, or at least it comes into consciousness, I am hurting the child, not necessarily I want to hurt the child. And there is, um, again, I didn't read the book, but uh, this idea of intergenerational trauma and Leda herself coming from a relationship with her mother that had some tension, some challenge, and perhaps also abuse. And we see this playing out with this, the, there's a doll that gets lost and Leda actually took the doll and has a relationship with the doll. And I wanna say more about that. However, in that moment where that little girl saying, kiss my finger, make it better, kiss it, kiss it. And the mother chooses to not engage as an act of asserting individuality. Like I, I, I am not going to, I, can't, I have nothing more to give. But there's also a cruelness and or if you live with attachment trauma, if you're watching that scene, it becomes a metaphor for all of the other scenarios and times where the, the missed opportunities uh, that the parent just did not see your request for connection and or some reassurance and affirmation. Now, I know that there's a number of parents who feel really guilty and or highly critical and or if they already have a relationship to themselves that includes some self shame that parents are very hard on themselves. And um, I think it's pretty common knowledge that um, the culture specifically of motherhood incl in includes a shadow aspect or a not so friendly critical component of monitoring one's behaviors and, and constantly thinking, are you a good mother? Are you the good mother? Are you a good mother? And so therefore it becomes very black and white, this dualistic idea, this extreme idea of, well, if you're not a good mother, then you must just be the bad mother. And this does not provide any range. Um, and perhaps you're familiar with uh, Winnicott, D.W. Winnicott, a uh, researcher, a psychologist who coined the phrase and through research looked at missed opportunities, missed connections between the quality of bonding in a mother and a child. And the conclusion was this phrase, the good, good enough mother. We don't need the good mother. We don't need, you know, we're, we hopefully are not uh, leading from being the bad mother, but that we have enough, so enough opportunities to be seen, known, heard, valued, appreciated, and understood, that what happens is that that in, of, uh, in and of itself is enough for the child to begin to create an, an interject, an internalized sense of my parent is available to me, my parent knows me, and if I need something, I'm able to go to my parent. Oh, by the way, the parent will make a mistake, the parent will mess up, the parent will miss an opportunity. But overall, as long as the, you know, the, the collective uh, number of interactions ultimately err on the side of providing mirroring and providing uh, that there's a curiosity to know the child. What happens for attachment injuries is that oftentimes the parent is so consumed with their own experience or they don't even have the skill. If we're talking about intergenerational trauma that the parent themselves did not have from their parents, interactions that nurtured a depth of reciprocity, of mutuality, of uh, emotional attunement, where it's led with this curiosity, I want to know about your inner world and I want to feel your inner world in real time with you as you describe it and as, as we feel it together. 
And in therapy lingo, there's this idea called the, the inner subjective field. And the inner subjective field is the place where there's, you know, I cross over with you and you cross over with me. And it, in a Venn diagram, it's that section in the middle. It's the, it's the I, you know, it's, it's you, it's me, and then it's the us. It's the we. And this we has a life of its own. And we, uh, certain uh, theoretical um, ways of explaining this, talk about it as this, um, this field of energy and it becomes this inner subjective field where it's not just uh, influenced by me, it's not just influenced by you, it has now a uh, consciousness of its own and a shared understanding and uh, emotional um, bonding and creating attachment really happen in this shared space. Uh, it's often described as well, uh, like if we think of dancing, um, if we're thinking of partner dancing or choreographed dancing, that the, the dancer is, is, is individually uh, um, giving into the movement and the choreography, but they're also mirroring and simultaneously in tune and attuned to their partner so that they're, move, they're symbiotically moving together. And there's a magic to that. There's, there, there's, a, there's a sweet spot of really feeling, really feeling alive. And that's, that's what we value in relationship. Now, if you had an experience in your family and specifically in childhood where the rhythm is just off or your choreography is different from the parent's choreography and you begin to try to anticipate how might you change your choreography and the movements and the mirroring to be able to anticipate what the parent is or isn't going to do and so to hopefully still get your needs met and this develops this really heightened sense of putting yourself on hold to then study the parent's needs which usually means the parent's uh, fears and anxieties and neurosis and we're we're very early age trying to accommodate the parent's fears anxiety and neurosis in order to get relationship that it, it becomes transactional you know i will help you with your neurotic anxious behavior and I will respond accordingly in hopes that I don't activate and trigger your trauma and maybe as a result uh, we will be able to be um, on the same page at the same time for a certain period of time so that our, the, it will simulate uh, attachment needs getting met as if you, the parent, really want to know me and want to connect to me in a place where we are sharing a, we're strengthening the bond. Something I've learned over the years that parents sometimes are short-sighted in their preparation for having a child. And they oftentimes don't think about how they're looking forward to a relationship with an adult, the adult child, and that they more quickly, their mind goes to the cute infant, the cute three-year-old um, enjoying, you know, taking the child to school for the very first time at age five. And the life experience, the, the experiences of going through um, childhood development and also that's going to mirror back to the parent. Uh, so the parent is now reflecting on uh, their own experience as a child as well. In a way we can reparent ourselves through bringing up children where we're getting a second chance at learning lessons about ourselves. And we might just be doing it from the place of the point of view of the parent, but we still benefit for who we are as a child. And many parents don't think about what kind of relationship do they want to have with their adult child? Uh, they, they sometimes frame, they, they, they don't think beyond a certain age. And also that really calls into question, well, what kind of adult relationship does the parent have with their parent? And usually where that relationship 
stalls or ends or gets um, that, 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 that no longer grows, that's often the same kind of relationship that a parent will create with their adult ch child. So what I'm finding, what I think is helpful in this film is we really get to think about how we were parented and the times when the parent was absent and disconnected from us. A number of people with attachment trauma um, have been either literally abandoned and or have an experience where they live with an abandonment wound even though they weren't necessarily literally abandoned. And that's what's so interesting about an abandonment wound. Uh, there doesn't need to literally be a story or an experience of abandonment. It could be that the parent was, again, so emotionally disconnected or hiding or, or dodging emotional connection, creating diversions, creating distractions to really know the parent. And it allowed the child to, always, to, to mostly have this feeling of, I just can't quite get close to my parent. And children then blame themselves. And say, well, that's my fault. There must be something wrong with me. I'm, I'm a bad kid. Some kids, some children in, in family systems, we, we take on roles. We learn roles are adaptive responses, adaptive behaviors to the family's challenges and tensions. And if we're not willing to see each other for who we are, and we need to manage some dysfunction. Uh, manage means keep it going, keep it going, keep it alive, that we're not really gonna change it, we're not really gonna heal from it. We need to figure out how to live with it. And the way that families live with their own dysfunction is that members take on roles. And this research, and we've seen this a lot in uh, families where addiction is present. And instead of attending to the addiction, uh, we have uh, the family member, uh, family members, plural, taking on different roles and they serve a function. And, and one of those roles is called the lost child, which is really interesting because the film and this, where it, the book is called, you know, the lost daughter makes me want to ask myself, or we could, you could ask yourself, you know, how are you the lost child? What this means, the lost child role is the child who doesn't make waves and uh, disappears into the woodwork or disappears into life in such a way that no longer has connection with the family. And that um, needed to adopt a rich fantasy life of daydreaming or imagining uh, life beyond the family, um, but also wanted to do so in such a way that um, essentially it's this idea of like, I'm just gonna exit through the back door and I'm not really going to like acknowledge, you know, uh, what, what, I am, uh, what I'm actually doing is I need to create some distance. Now the function and the role of this is that the child is, is being incredibly generous by not calling attention to themselves. Generous in the sense that they are trying to um, um, uh, diminish uh, opportunities for arguments or tension or um, disconnect that would be very hurtful. And they're trying to just um, stay out of the, the middle of the action or the drama or whatever's going down. The lost child is often called a, a loner. Uh, now keep in mind, this does not need to be literal. You don't need to literally be a loner. You don't need to like you know, literally disconnect from your family. But think of it in terms of a, a kind of metaphor or emotionally. You know, you're, you're emotionally a loner. Uh, this might really mirror your attachment style, your insecure attachment patterns, the ways that you keep yourself emotionally hidden and the way you have learned how not to engage the family, not to take risks, not to be emotionally vulnerable because it's just not safe. And uh, the role that you're going to take in the family is, I am not someone who's going to show up here and, and I need to pull out of this. Now there's other roles. Uh, you might've heard of these, like, like the mascot or the clown uh, provides comic relief and is a way to distract. There's a lot of, you know, through humor and levity, the clown can um, be, release, release the pressure that's building up. The clown's like a pressure valve 
We also have the hero, the overachiever, uh, the golden child, um, and and this this role is the is is the projection of all the success and goodness and and a representation of the potential of who the family could be. And we do not need to speak to our dysfunction. We do not need to heal family wounds. We do not need to look at intergenerational trauma because the hero will be a savior of sense and will transcend all of that family uh, discord. And the hero will deliver us into a different level of such great success and that we will, we will bask in the glory and the glow of the success of the hero. Now, maybe a parent puts that pressure on a child, which is an outrageous amount of pressure for the child to have, but also children do that to themselves to think, well, I have to be good. I have to be so good. I have to be an overachiever. And I don't want to call any attention to the loneliness, the loss, the grief, the tension, uh, the, the sadness, the deep sadness of living in a family where the parent is the phrase I like to use, there, not there. And, and that, that is so, that creates this ongoing chronic sadness. The child has no place, no, nowhere to put it with the exception through activities, through behaviors of overachievement. So we have the lost child, we have the clown, the mascot, we have the hero, we also have a scapegoat. Uh, the scapegoat, it can be the black sheep. Um, it's the same way that the hero is the projection and the repository for all the potential of everything golden and good in the family. The, the, unfortunately, it's so painful to even say this, but the scapegoat uh, and the black sheep is the opposite of that. It becomes the projection and the repository of everything that's wrong with the family. Uh, this often shows up in therapy as the uh, identified patient. And the identified patient is, you know, you know the family's fine, the family's fine. You know, individually, mom is fine, dad is fine, everybody's fine. But this one, the scapegoat, the black sheep, they're not fine. And, and the only reason we're in therapy is we got to fix the identified patient. We got to fix something's going on with them. And if only we could figure out how to make them good because they're bad uh, or, you know, they're the one with the problem. We need to fix their problem. Then we would, we would all be fine in the family. So it's a very myopic, a very um, putting on blinders and absolving oneself of any responsibility of, of, of the co-creation of dysfunction and how everyone is, is participating in it together. Um, it's, it's a way, it, it's, a form, it's another form of denial and deflection at the expense of the child. Now I know that there's another, there's another um, role and I'm trying to think uh, we have we have, I did write it down. I have notes here. Let me see here real quick, quick. The enabler, caretaker, parentified child. So the enabler, the child. Um, I, I've also learned it as the role of the helper. It's the child who becomes parentified and takes on too much responsibility. And through this idea of caring for either the parent or let's say the other siblings, the, this, it, the, the child becomes a little adult and is no longer able to have a, a, their own childhood. I wanna switch uh, really to, to bring in some of the themes and ideas of the film and this Leda, the main character, has this history of where she left her kids and has created a unintegrated traumatic scar. And when she's on vacation, she sees a, a woman with a daughter whose name is Nina and this woman has is also this mother who has similar stress and frustration around the demands being placed on her by her daughter 
And this is enough to serve as a trigger. So we get to see a trauma response or the intensification of stress and anxiety take over when the main character, Leda, sees this other mother, Nina. And there's a scene where the child has a doll and the child is uh, abusing the doll by biting its face. And technically the child's not abusing the doll, the child's just a child biting the face. But the, 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 the meaning that we assign to it there and specifically how, how it's shot, the, the, the camera, and how the, the main character Leda responds, we do get a sense that this is pointing towards Leda's history of being in the role of perpetuating trauma, of hurting her own children, but then also the letting in some awareness of abuse and or how she was abandoned or her attachment needs were not met. And we see in that little vignette the, the way that the trauma is passed down and what one generation does, it's very highly probable that it's going to play out again and again and again. What happens in, in this film is the relationship that Leda has with this young girl's doll because Leda steals the doll, she takes the doll and she, it takes, these scenes are very interesting because it becomes this idea like a transitional object, it becomes a symbolic object. In some ways wanting to reparent her own daughters for the missed time to want to imagine, can I go back into that time and be a parent? But it also introduces this idea of reparenting ourselves and very much this idea of like inner child. And it's just a beautiful symbol to explore from a therapeutic standpoint that this doll is really representing Leda's relationship with her own younger self and or tapping into the relationship of herself as a younger mother and how to, what to do with this doll, what to do with this um, uh, extra, this, this form, this body, this doll's body that gets carried around. What do we do with it? And we see her, she shoves it in the cupboard and she puts it in the trash and she takes it out of the trash and then she cleans it off. And then she also, she buys clothes for it. Like she's, she's entering a uh, alternate dissociative world of trying to trauma reenactment of playing out and working out what is my relationship to this helpless doll and having a relationship with it. And it's very interesting in the film, there's a scene when she's with Ed Harris and she happens to say, well, I'm cruel, I was cruel. And, and then Ed Harris's character, uh, they have an evening, like have a date and, and he mentions, he said, well, I'm cruel too. That, that to me does not feel like shame. It doesn't feel like um, 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 disparaging herself. There's an acknowledgement of the humanness of our shortcomings and that sometimes we do make choices that we feel we have to, but Nonetheless, we have an awareness that can hurt others and come across as cruel. It's interesting to Ed Harris, the actor in the film, and this film being about a mother who abandons the kids, I cannot help but think one of my favorite films is The Hours, and Julianne Moore's character is his mother, and there's these flashbacks, and she ends up leaving him. Uh, so it's very interesting that perhaps, I don't know if there's a thematically something, and for the actor Ed Harris that it speaks to him of why he wants to work on these projects. Um, but there's a, there's a parallel of what we get to see of, of a parent so fundamentally crushed by the loss of identity and still being asked to give more and more and more and where your 
own body and being is no longer yourself and you're intruded upon. And it's this intrusion that also mirrors the same word that we use for the a trauma symptom of a bombardment of memories or bombardment of trauma or even anxiety and feelings in the body. It, we're intruded upon. And there's, there's this um, need to escape. And to me, that's what really this idea of Leda going on vacation, this, she's in this bubble, this paradise place. Near the end with the doll um, where uh, she gives the doll back and gives the doll to the mother, to Nina. And Nina says, why, why did you take the doll? Why, why did you take it? And she says, I don't know. I don't know. And I think that that's so telling too because so much of therapeutic work and therapy and trauma healing is constantly working with the unknown and our inability to have the to to have the concrete knowing of the why the origin of the why you know why was i abused why was i abandoned why did my parent not want to know who i am as a as a human being why is my parent not curious about who i am today uh, why do I still continue to create relationships where both of us are emotionally unavailable? You know, why, why, why? And in that moment, Nina says to Leda, why did you take the doll? And she says, I don't, I don't know. And then in that scene, there is a bit of a burst of aggression, a burst of violence. There's this hat pin and this hat pin pierces Leda, the character uh, in her body and although they don't necessarily completely show it, um, I take liberties here for myself and just say, I mean, it's, she's piercing the bubble of the womb, the, the bubble of the paradise, the bubble of dissociation, and the, the bubble of still trying to make a relationship with the idea of her children at a, at a very young age. And in fact, we know her children are now adults. And that, that experience most probably impacted the children and who they are as adults today. But the only way for them, I, I have to be careful to say the only way to heal, but a main way for them to heal is they still have to come into the present moment and what is their relationship like today? That we could create some forgiveness, we could create uh, working and reworking the meaning behind why did she leave. But the relationship to thrive today has to be grounded in some real world, present moment relating and to nourish. It's like watering a garden. We need, we need to water the garden now. And we do get to see Leda, the main character, on the phone with one of her daughters and, and speaking, falling right back into uh, the, the routine of interaction that we assume that she's had for some time. But Leda's still trying to work out and or she didn't have a choice. She's on vacation and by seeing the, the other mother and child with the greater extended family and other uh, things happening, uh, Leda cannot run away from it. It's still, she still needs to make peace of that moment in time that was hurtful for everyone. And what's very interesting is when she shares this with Nina, Nina says, well, what was it like to leave your children for a couple of years before you came back? And the main character Leda says, well, it was amazing. She still needed the adventure. She still needed the, the experience, the expansion beyond the ordinary burden of responsibility. And that she had enough insight or wherewithal to live and to grab it. And at the same time knew she missed her kids and that she still had a job to do. I think it would be either cliche or even um, a bit misguided if we would think that, you know, she's, you know, how was it leaving your children? And she says, you know, the, the worst years of my life or something. She was able to go out and developmentally, she needed something for herself beyond uh, that, that she could not give or was not able to fulfill in her role as a mother. 
which, which brings me to the, the component of compassion. I mean, the film is very compassionate. Again, I haven't read the book, so I'm not certain of the voice of the voice of compassion, but I have to assume it's, it's still there. And that is what I believe Maggie Gyllenhaal picked up in, in the screenplay. And that there, there's a very objective, the same way that a therapist, you know, if a therapist heard I, I left my kids, um, this is reminding me of a story and I'm very sensitive to not telling stories of clients because even though technically it does not breach confidentiality, I am a keeper of personal stories and, and uh, um, actually, you know, I'm a gate, I'm a, I'm a keeper of trauma stories. Um, but I did have an experience to see if how, how I can tell this story with the least amount of uh, information to just be respectful to the client. The client had a, an adult child who was very high needs and the parent who was my client could not, um, could not keep care of the adult child um, at this, at an age and really needed state assistance and needed to get into a state a funded program of housing and benefits, etc. But because of the mother making a certain amount of money and still having the opportunity to keep the child in the home, the state denied the mother these services. And the mother researched and learned that the only way for her child to actually begin to participate in the system that was set up to help people who had the same challenges that she does. She would have to no longer uh, have the option to live at home with her mother. So her mother had to emotionally make a choice and to emotionally prepare to take her daughter to a safe public place where she knew she would be taken care of in the immediate sense. But she dropped her off there and drove away and then drove around the corner so she could spy on her daughter to make sure that someone showed up to help her. This is so gut-wrenching. I mean, I was in awe of this client and there's a lot of feelings of, you know, you really put yourself in that position and say, would I do that? Would I really go through the emotional upheaval? And her daughter was, was frightened, you know, in her daughter, it was difficult to have that experience of realizing, you know, mom just left. Now this story, as intense as it is, and if, this if the client ever watches this video, with all respect that I've shared this story in service of supporting all of us in our healing process. And I happen to, this client is a public speaker and she speaks on trauma and she's written a book about trauma and she shares uh, aspects of her story openly. So that is consistent with who she is. So I, I feel pretty confident that she'd be uh, on board with the fact that I shared this. However, um, what happened was the the daughter ended up getting moving into a group home and receiving services and in a rather quick period of time um, entered the new phase of independence and living a, an adult life that the mother knew she was unable to give her daughter and that alone to teach her every, all the life skills that she needed, the mother knew she was unable to do it. So she had to literally leave her daughter um, and she did everything she could to monitor to make sure that her daughter was taken care of. And then a couple days later, a couple weeks later, you know, the, 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 the services, the, the organization providing the services contacted her and um, they went through that process of getting her daughter moved into this group home. So it really completely worked in her favor, but he, it's 
being a psychotherapist and sitting across from someone who has the strength, the courage to go through that process because she so much believes that at the other end of the process, on the other side, is she's doing it for her daughter. And then also, you know, just for clarifications for this video, the mother very much, very quickly started visiting the daughter and, uh, you know, uh, made connections with the case managers and, and the, the house managers and, and had, a, had just equally as much involvement and presence in her daughter's life. But there was a, a window of time of like a week to 10 days where she had to walk away from her daughter, who's a special needs person. So um, it's so easy in those moments to feel the judgment, the nauseousness, the fear, to also like to, to see it as having courage And in a way, the character Leda in the film, it's like she's physically, yes, literally, yes, leaving her children, but she's also walking away to do the same thing. And the example that I gave about my client is that she's doing it to save herself. And just think about, sure, she left her children. Yes, she was gone for two or three years. But think about how that experience itself actually allowed her somehow to tap into a set of resources or the next the next reserve of energy so that she could return and uh, in and, and finish out the years that were left which were, were a good number of years of, of needing to parent and of these children's lives and so think like what kind of parent would lay to be if she didn't take that break now, I'm not necessarily advocating we would leave and abandon a child and just take off for X number of years, but it does really call into question that if you don't know who you are, you're depleted and you're lost, and you feel like your life is driven by the burden of obligation, what kind of presence and availability, emotional availability, are you actually providing anyway? And that we might need to figure out how do I hit a pause? How do I escape into some kind of bubble of self-reflection, you know, my own bubble of development that I, I really need to figure out who I am and I, I need to attend to my own despondency and irritation and anger that that burst out in the middle of parenting and maybe taking x number of weeks um, i can't imagine the time frame that we put on it and we would somewhat hope that it would not be an extreme time period to create adverse effects for the child but we might need to very purposefully create some distance so that we can come back into closeness. It's very intentional. And that's the problem with attachment trauma. We're so on autopilot, in denial, dissociated. Our choices around relating is not very intentional. And the attachment injuries, the attachment trauma is created from lack of presence and lack of intentionality. It's the keeping each other invisible and ignoring each other. And again, the parallel for, for what's going on here, the, the main character Leda is ignoring herself. She's made herself invisible to herself. Her identity is compromised. And so then that's playing out. That's what she's doing to her children, that her children become invisible and distant and uh, no longer um, no longer seeing the children. I mean, even the way it was shot in the film, you don't get individual relationship. You don't get to see the aspects of the daughter's characters, of their uniqueness. You more, you, you consistently get that they are this objectified, one-sided, 
burden, who, who is, is, is neediness, that, that constantly needs something. And so the way that the, the parent is only experiencing the child is as this bottomless pit of neediness. Um, we, need, we need to have breaks in there from the neediness. And I think it's a bit counterintuitive, but one, one way to, to attend to that is we'd have to actually show up and offer some different kind of emotional openness it's different from the burden of, of feeling exhausted and tired of needing to do something and caretake. It's more of let's be together, this kind of being. The questions to ask yourself, what is your history of a parent checking out and disconnecting from you? In some ways, how are you lost? It's, it's, so, it's relatively easy. Uh, what I'm gonna say is, I mean, many of us who come and enter into therapy, it's because life is not working or we have reached a crossroads where we do feel a bit depleted and uncertain. But over the years, I've had a number of clients and in the process of talking very early on and even like in our first session, I will ask, I will say, how long have you been lost? And it, it is amazing. Um, there's a very high percentage of people who hear that question and they have this look of a kind of surprise and disgust for being called out, but then also a kind of elation and appreciation that they're being called out because finally someone sees it. Finally, someone is speaking to it. And a number of clients will say, how did you know that I'm lost? And I usually don't answer it directly. I'll say, if you're lost, where did you go? Were you ever here? Do we need to find you? How do we find you? Or if you're the next version of yourself and a version that you haven't met, who is that person? Where are they? And how do we get connection with them? How do we find them? How do we create a relationship with the aspirational aspect of who you're becoming? Because if you don't do that, you're, you're going to be disconnected from life force. Your, your spirit is wilting. You're, you're parenting as a zombie, as a robot, as a shell of yourself. You're in your marriage as a zombie, as a robot, as a shell of yourself. You're going to work as a zombie, as a robot, as a shell of yourself. And this is so crushingly painful to observe one's own wilting, you know, one's, one's own, to, to see your life force energy just drain out of you. And you know that, you know, you need to do something different. One last idea here is we're asking ourselves these questions the doll is really interesting because we haven't even talked about inner child work and this idea that the doll is a representation of Leda's own wounded self and that she's trying to have this relationship with herself um, through physical, uh, concrete, real interaction with this object. And um, there's something incredibly personal about what I'm going to share next, and I'm on the fence about whether or not to share it. Um, I had a dream image, and it had to do around a um, exploring a, a feeling linked to attachment trauma around the phrase, you're not special, you're not special. And I got this image, um, it was kind of like a, a lucid waking dream image of standing with uh, my younger self or who I was as a younger self, age two, age three, age four, and just holding the hand, sort of like if you've seen the movie, the, 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 the movies about Scrooge and goes back into, you know, to see Christmas past and uh, the, the way that uh, you get to see um, things play out. And what, what I learned or, or what happened in that moment was just standing on the, side, on the sidelines as a neutral observer to that disconnect 
in my family and that the four-year-old self had an experience of I'm I I'm getting the message I'm not special and I was holding his hand imaginary hand and I really had this I I've worked with clients over the years and I'll say turn it into a ritual create an art project create a tangible interaction in real time concrete time and space which uh, could be you know paint your anger could be um, create some ritual where you burn something you bury something um, but it's this this activity of, of where you're exploring the feelings and along those same lines I ended up purchasing a doll and um, I do acknowledge, you know, it, it, it is by cultural standards, societal standards, it's a little weird, you know, to be an adult man. And I have an easy excuse to say, well, I'm a psychotherapist. I work with people all the time and we need these transitional objects. And, you know, I'm using it to project, you know, these unintegrated wounds that I carry and it's really helping me go through a therapeutic process. So in that sense, I can explain it away and it totally makes sense. And by the way, it was in my car in a, in, in a gym bag sitting in the front seat and I would go to the park and in my car, you know, I would put a hand on the doll's hand and I would very pur- purposefully, consciously through that physicality, remember the four-year-old who in a number of ways was getting a message that he's not seen, he is not known, and as a result is creating the conclusion and the feeling that he's not special. And even at many, many years later at my current age, still challenged to integrate and to make peace with the depth of sadness and the how how much fear it can provoke and live in the unconscious for a child to really let in that um, my family members don't really know me and at age four i wasn't even totally conscious of that it takes you know it's only in my i've been doing healing work since you know my mid-20s i've been in therapy and on and off you know since my um, my major really breakthrough therapist was around age 27 uh, for about four and a half years and then on again, off again, and another therapist. But all those years still not really fully bringing into consciousness how frightening it is when you see your own insignificance mirrored back to you in family members who by compassionately we acknowledge all of the obstacles in which they were not taught to do that either and that's the intergenerational trauma and there's such a deep sadness here and in a way that's what therapy is to to keep you know am i able to return to this deep sadness am i able to return to this deep rage am i able to learn about when the trauma gets triggered and how i am playing out my own traumatic wounds in relationship in real time with new people. And so um, for the character Leda, she had this doll and she's working out her own relationship with her inner child self. And it's important to the inner child self. um, It doesn't mean that literally there's an inner child inside of us. It's saying we're able to you know, like a great actor, which this is a good example because we're talking about a film, you personify a part of yourself, you personify your feelings, and then you can use your imagination in the same way a child uses playfulness, and you use your imagination to interact and exchange with this part of yourself that seems to have a life of its own or a mind of its own. If we don't use the word inner child, if we just say grief, and we say, well, if your grief could speak, what does your grief want to say to you? If your rage could speak, what what does your rage want to say to you? If abandonment could speak, what does your abandonment want to say to you? Thank you for listening. This was a really long video. Um, I feel like we could just keep going, Uh, maybe not forever, but um, there's a couple other ideas in there. It's such a rich film. 
Um, a lot of respect to the artist, the actors, the writers, who pull something together like that. It's just so amazing. Uh, in ending this uh, video, wanted to acknowledge, uh, to think about why do we do this work? And I like to say emotional connections matter. We do this work because emotional connections matter. And then I say, I do this work and share videos with you to offer encouragement that healing trauma and specifically also healing attachment trauma is possible. That a, a, a number of sources around research does tell us and let us know that we can learn new ways for better relating and that is actually a very a positive assumption that we are maturing and that we are growing. And so in the spirit of uh, beating the drumbeat of keep going, keep going one foot in front of the other, um, I want to offer you hope and encouragement. We often feel disconnected from ourselves uh, as if we can access fragmented parts of ourself. And what we're doing through this personal healing process is to put those pieces back together, but we're doing it slightly differently, putting them together anew. And I like the word like remembering, R-E hyphen member. That's how we're, we're putting ourselves back together. We're pulling in the parts of ourselves uh, ultimately to craft a new experience of wholeness. And this plays out through relationship. And this plays out through getting to know yourself. And this video was in the spirit of getting to know ourselves. I hope that this was helpful. Remember, uh, if you like this video, uh, click the like button, click subscribe, do the, uh, leave a comment, all those things. Uh, I know that you've heard that 800 times. And if you want to become a sustaining supporter, you can create a, uh, you could uh, uh, create a donation. You could join us in the membership community, improve your relationships, or you could also purchase one of my courses. More videos to come. Thank you so much. See you next time.